Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Chris Young, the head of the School of Arts and Humanities in Cambridge, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this, uh, the inaugural lecture of the Global Humanities Initiative. Thank you very much for coming on this special occasion, and a very warm welcome, too, to those who are joining us via live stream. We're delighted that you could be with us, and we're grateful for your interest and support. The Global Humanities Initiative is one of three flagship projects set out in the School of Arts and Humanities 10-year vision 2020 to 2030. The aim of Global Humanities is to create new, genuinely global perspectives on the most pressing issues facing the world today. Since 2020, we have been proud to build a network with partners around the world. Nanjing and Fudan in China, Ashoka in India, the American University of Beirut in Lebanon, Sabanchi University in Turkey, and Diego Portales in Chile. All of our partners are committed to the belief that deep and enduring engagement with each other is now more essential than ever. We're working hard together to transform the way we teach, research, and think about the humanities. Our ultimate aim is to create a global MPhil and to found a research institute and we've made significant steps in this direction. Despite the pandemic, we have founded and expanded our network and launched a global mobility scheme for academic exchange and collaboration. As travel opens up again, we know this will be transformative. You can find out more about our activities on the new website, which has gone live for the event today. So today's event is less of a launch than a celebration of activities already underway and the long-awaited commencement of in-person meetings and conversations, which we hope will accelerate us further towards our ultimate goals. We're delighted to have with us today Pankaj Mishra. Pankaj is a prolific, prize-winning author of books and essays. Most notably, he's the recipient of the prestigious Wyndham Campbell Prize for Nonfiction, awarded by Yale University. His literary criticism and cultural commentary have tracked the ruptures of the early 21st century, as the Financial Times recently put it, exploring the advance of neoliberalism, the war on terror, the financial crisis, and the rise of authoritarian populism. His widely uh, read essays, the FT notes, are sharp and provocative. His work will be well known to many of you, either from uh, the journals and papers such as the New York Times, the New Yorker, New York Review of Books, the London Review of Books, The Guardian, or from between the covers of his own books, from The Ruins of Empire, The Intellectuals Who Remade Asia, and Age of Anger, A History of the Present, to name but a few. Pankaj, we're honored to have you here with us this afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. Pankaj will be in discussion with Shruti Kapila. Shruti is Associate Professor in the History Faculty she works on modern um, and contemporary India and global political thought and is widely published in the media, both in India and the UK. She's also the author of a recently published book, Violent Fraternity in the Indian Age, which appeared with Princeton University Press last year and which treats the topics of sovereignty, democracy, violence and republicanism. It's already making a significant impact on the field. Shruti's also trained to be a psychoanalyst, so I'm, I'm intrigued to hear her questions about the characters of the book we'll be discussing this evening. It's particularly apt that Shruti is sharing the stage this evening. Uh, she is, along with me, one of the four Cambridge directors of the Global Humanities Initiative. Uh, Shruti, it's been a great pleasure to work with you, Hans and Ezra. Um, your collective energy and vision have been invaluable, and without them, this initiative would not have become reality. Over the last two years, we and our partners have, around the world have been wonderfully supported by two outstanding administrators, first uh, Theodora Anderson, and since last autumn, uh, Greta Mijares. Um, Greta has organized this evening's event, uh, no mean feat as we get used to the complexity of life in uh, what I hope is a waning pandemic. So thank you, Greta. Pankaj Mishra will be reading from and discussing his latest work, Hide and Run, which appeared in January. The Romantics, his first novel back in 2000, was highly acclaimed 
and not surprisingly and justifiably, Hide and Run has been attracting much attention. The novel is about three friends who meet at the Indian Institute of Technology and tracks their different journeys as they negotiate a world of new possibilities in the 30 or so years since the 1980s. It's a novel about the new India, its place in the world, and how individuals forge and negotiate their destinies as that place shifts and turns. It's hard to imagine a contemporary novel better suited to the issues at the heart of our Global Humanities Initiative. First of all, Hide and Run is an overtly intertextual book. It references many other works and authors, most prominently V.S. Nepal and F. Scott Fitzgerald. The world is what it is. Men who are nothing, who allow themselves to become nothing, have no place in it. These, the opening lines of Nepal's A Bend in the River, appear on its first page and permeate the novel as its characters are swept into ever greater riches at the pace of Jay Gatsby behind the wheel of his sports car, a motif also directly referenced. Hide and Run stands on its own as a piece of literature, but it is richer and more thought-provoking as an experience when read in relation to other texts, and I'm grateful to you for sending me back to some of those. In this sense, it's a paradigm for global humanities and our endeavor to bring traditions from different cultures into profound, productive dialogue with each other. At the same time, it's a cautionary tale, for while the novel is about the relationship of the past to a rapidly changing present, it highlights the danger of failing to make that connection fruitful. As its narrator, Arun, comments about his friend, Asim, who likes quoting lots of other authors, I can see the danger he never reckoned with, that in our attempts to remake ourselves to become real men simply by pursuing our strongest desires and impulses with no guidance from family, religion, or philosophy, our self-awareness would narrow, the distortions in our characters would go unnoticed until the day we awakened with horror to the people we had become. Hide and Run points the way for global humanities, both by how it is constructed as a novel and in the failures of its characters, which it so minutely describes. It is therefore with great anticipation and appreciation that I hand over to Pankaj Mishra and Shruti Kapila for what I know will be a wide-ranging and very fruitful conversation. Thank you for coming. Welcome, everyone. Um, and it's a true personal uh, and unique pleasure to be in conversation with um, someone I've admired, read all through my adult life, and I'm also very lucky to know him um, personally a little bit. And so it's, um, I'm, without sort of going further you know, into the conversation first, I thought you would read out for a bit so that people can get a taste, yes. both here and online, of some of the characters of the novel and the themes of the novel. Thank you. And thank you, Chris, for your very um, kind, um, eloquent introduction. And I should say also, um, basically repeat, repeat what, what you just said, what an honor and uh, privilege it is, and a pleasure, of course, to be in conversation with uh, Shruti. Um, so I'm, I thought I'll read from, I just decided this, I'm going to read from three different parts of the book. The book describes many journeys, both physical, um, psychological. And the physical journey consists of uh, a man, young man from a small town, going to Delhi to uh, prepare for the entrance exams to the Indian Institute of Technology, uh, which I'm sure all of you know is, is, is seen by many Indians as a kind of gateway to the world's richness. So there is that journey in the 1980s, then there's a brief stint in Delhi, which I'm going to read from in the late 1990s. And then there is a journey, final journey, uh, not the final, but penultimate journey, which is in London, in the present. Um, so those are the three bits, short bits, um, I thought I'm going to, I should read from. Uh, so the first one is actually a, a, a small train journey. Uh, this is, again, this will remind you of a, of a country that really doesn't exist anymore because it had steam engines back then. For two years before I got into IIT and left my childhood home for good, 
I attended coaching classes in Delhi. Like Asim and Birendra, I always returned home with a growing dread of what I would find there. How agonizingly vivid are those scenes from the 1980s in which I find some clues to our later conduct? The train from Old Delhi Station, obstinately fuming and grinding across the plains of Punjab and Haryana, reached Devli at about five in the morning. Narrow, roofless platforms hurtled past the windows of my second-class unreserved carriage all night, the wind through the bars blowing cold dust in my air. When the train stops, I see a dimly lit station platform where coolies prowl, always in twos, ready to rush the rare alighting passenger, ready to roll their scarves into a circular pad on their head and receive a metal trunk on this impromptu cushion before mincingly walking away into the night. From somewhere comes the clatter of an iron cart and the clank, clank and dong, dong of a hammer testing wheels. Shadowy people pass the windows, never to be seen again. One of them turns halfway around, but only to squirt a tremendous spit of pan juice onto the floor. Then, with several hisses, the coach lurches off, passing the signalman holding up a lantern, his face fiendish in the trembling green glow, and a small low building housing a row of levers. It rocks gently as it switches tracks, the few lights thin, and the extensive night outside my window resumes its course, but not for long. I sit on a straight-packed wooden bench, wedged in between several people and facing a similarly tense row on the opposite side, with sinking heads jerking up, and then again starting to slowly sink. In the bunk above me, the faint yellowish light of the lamps expose a jumble of half-slumbering bodies with mouths open like fish. Sometimes I doze off, but the train whistles with piercing melancholy, stutters over a level crossing, roars into a loud tunnel. The metal window shutter starts clattering in its frame. Or the man next to me, sitting hunched over, his big strong nose snoring softly and giving off a thick smell of sweat, suddenly slumps onto my lap. My whole body goes tense. I want so badly to stretch my legs and put up my feet on, up on something. And in that state of immobility, I become convinced that happiness will be always beyond my reach. Now the second bit is when he's, Delhi, he's in Delhi, he's a little bit older, he has a, a small yeah, job. One of his friends, friends Asim, Asim the, the two friends uh, described in the novel, has become, or is on his way to becoming, a uh, big uh, media tycoon. And he now lives in a, in a rather nice house. And the narrator often uh, visits this house to see uh, personally, uh, to, to witness these sort of massive social transformations that are happening in India in the, in the, in the 1990s. Um, Asim's company was sustaining not just to me, but to many other young people who sought escape from low middle class depression but didn't know how to achieve it. For previous generations, progress in life so far would have meant going through the motions prescribed by caste and class together. The imperatives of education, inevitably vocational, marriage, nearly always arranged with love regarded as a folly of callow youth, parenthood and professional career with the government, imposed order without too many troubling questions about their purpose and meaning. Regional and caste background dictated culinary and sartorial habits. Kurta pajamas and saris or shalwar kameezes at home. Drab western style clothes outside. An unchanging menu of dal, vegetables, rotis and lice, rice. Leavened in some households with non-alcoholic drinks. Asim's first publication in the IIT literary magazine was Neruda style odes to Ruh Avza and Kisan's orange squash, Complan, Ovaltine, and Elaichi Horlicks. We belong to a relatively daring generation whose members took on the responsibility of crafting their own lives, working in private jobs, marrying for love, eating pasta, pizza, and chow mein, as well as parathas and drinking cola and beer. At home, 
Taking beach vacations rather than going on pilgrimages and wearing jeans and t-shirts rather than the safari suits that had come to denote style to the preceding generation of middle class Indians. Our choices were expanded far beyond what my parents or Asims could even imagine. And for those making this rapid and confusing transition, Asims rented flat in Saket, where he lived with his wife Mrinal, opened up a tantalizing window on a possible new life. The Indian media was breaking free of its state past then. Some of the most established print journalists were mutating into television personalities, and they were all there at Asim's parties, along with colleagues from his magazine. Another regular I remember was a police officer, a former head of Jammu and Kashmir police, celebrated in the media for his methods of extrajudicial killing and torture, but known in Asim's circles for his stupendous recall of Faz's poetry. Far below the rest in social status were young journalists from small towns with scruffy and fringed khadi jolas hanging from one shoulder. Asim had told these children of Kalyan reading government officials, teachers, and doctors to rid themselves of the third-rate worldviews of their parents and aspire for something higher than a government job, a Maruti van, and honeymoon in Missouri. He told them that a new hyper-connected world of unprecedented possibility was emerging the internet was facilitating a broad emancipation that would dissolve old frontiers and enlarge horizons. It was from Asim in the mid-1990s that I first heard, heard the words globalization and information superhighway. He was also the first person I knew to own a mobile phone, a laptop, and a smartphone. He urged the small town strivers to follow his example and aspire to an adventure of the mind, spirit, and body on the lines laid down by Oscar Wilde to cure the soul by means of the senses and the senses by means of the soul. Whether or not the inheritors of petty bourgeois aspirations follow these instructions, they saw Asim as their hero. He had energetically opened up whole new possibilities of growth and fun in a city still dominated by Doer upper-class Anglophiles. Many of them consented to work for his later ventures without a regular salary. Initially bound to him, like me, with admiration, they developed over time an enormous desire to move with him and like him, unsurprised and buoyant through a globalized world. Gliding through his parties, taller than most people in the room in the long white kurta and churidars he had exchanged with Chukun Kurtis, Asim seemed to love the moment of contact the handshake, the hug, and unlike the hosts at the party, parties of my colleagues, he radiated, radiated the same charm and liveliness to all. His eyes, however, remained watchful, even as he smiled and laughed, quite like those of his cat that would crouch throughout his parties under a planter's armchair, her gaze from green flashing eyes unbroken, even when the swirl of a sari or shawl swept a glass of wine from a side table onto the floor. I recalled at one point that Asim, still pursuing his IIT ambition to be known as an artist, had become obsessed with writing a novel. A Suitable Boy had just been published. Asim's own magazine put the novel on its cover. And he wrote a flattering profile of the author, comparing him to Homer and Tolstoy. Privately, he rubbished the novel as a soap opera and declared his own literary <coughs> ambition. I promised Brinal before we got married, he often said, that I would write a novel by the age of 30. I don't have the time now, boss, but I know you can't jerk out a novel just because your father is a big bureaucrat or judge, and you have been to Oxford. <laughs> I know how to make India look like the in thing to publishers in London and New York. He claimed the novel was being reduced by a socially ambitious Indian bourgeoisie to a showpiece, and he seemed curiously bitter about it all. It's such a subversive form, artistically, potentially, he would say. Look at what the Latin Americans from small town backgrounds like Garcia Marquez did with it. I never expect much from American and British writers, especially the whiteies. Their imaginations are limited by their first world privileges. They can escape only from ironical self-regard. And New York and London have the cultural clout to pass off their second rate stuff as first rate. But there's no reason for our desi bourgeois writers to infect the novel with a bad conscience, narcissism, and fundamental unseriousness. 
Indian writers have so much rich material, and yet these pampered kids are playing with art and making it flabby. One of these kids actually worked at my office. She was, in fact, a co-editor of the Literary Review. The daughter of a pipe-smoking, lushly sideburned eminence in the British civil services, she had gone to Cambridge, of course, on a fellowship arranged by her father. Regarded there as brilliantly beautiful, her pale skin, dusky hair, and light hazel eyes, inspiring from some light undergraduate verse, she had made it known that she was working on a novel titled The Sherry Drinkers, <laughs> An account both satirical and melancholy of Indians like herself who find themselves spiritually marooned in India after returning from an exhilarating stint at Cambridge. Faber and Faber have taken it on, she some said. They are thrilled with it. She told me this not long after I started working at the Literary Review and then added, do you know it? It's T.S. Eliot's old firm. <laughs> A couple of years later, she brought it up again. Knopf are looking at it. They're very excited about it. After another couple of years, she said, Faber are really thrilled with it. I reported all this to Asim without telling him that she rejoiced most in the cooler talk comparison of him to Barry White. <laughs> Boss, that's crazy, Asim said, his voice going up again rapidly. I know that every pampered Indian kid who has been to Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard wants to write a novel these days. <laughs> but I can't believe that chick can write a 2,000 word piece that's readable, let alone a novel. The perennially aspiring novelist, as, he, as Asim dubbed her, was a representative member of what Narendra Modi later denounced to an electoral windfall as the Lachian's elite, and what his army of trolls took to calling liptards. In many ways, Asim anticipated this cultish, heady detestation of the anglophilic occupants of New Delhi's British-built bungalows. He loved quoting Bazarov's line from Turgenev's Fathers and Children, which we had read and reread at IIT. You are nothing but a soft, beautifully bred liberal boy. His own words, Chikna and Raja Beta Raja Beti, <laughs> expressed a similar disdain for India's cos cosseted rolling class. One of his diligently formulated sentences in this regard was, these smooth-cheeked liberals, these chikanas, these Raja Betas and Raja Betis want to convert the surplus of their posh upbringing into the immortality of art. Modi would come at the Lachans elite with the Ersatz nativism, claiming to be the son of an humble Chaiwender who doesn't know English and sees no reason why he should. Asim faulted the sherry drinkers in precisely the realm that they claimed superior skill. Have I gone on for too long? No, no, that's fine. So I'm going to read from the last bit here, which is the narrator in London in the present moment. He's by now a middle-aged um, person. And he's been led to London by his um, girlfriend, a young Muslim woman that he meets while he's living in uh, a village, uh, uh, a Himalayan village in, in India, and falls in love with her and follows her. To, uh, to London and moves into this class, this group of people that he has previously, you know, had absolutely no access to, knows very little about. Uh, he's living in Kensington in this very large apartment. Um, and this is the chapter. We worked in the mornings and afternoon in separate rooms until he needed help with your book. We made love a lot, often during the afternoons, starting with the most fleeting of touches and though it was not the same, the early excitement and joy were gone. Holding you closer still made me feel that my arms had been empty for too long. In the evenings, we went to dinner parties and films. We attended book launches. And these outings were preceded by the spectacle I never ceased to relish of you before wardrobe and mirror, dreamily fine-tuning your appearance. After dinner somewhere, initially at some white draped table with napkin pyramids, in a restaurant freshly recommended by the Evening Standard, where waiters opened menus as gingerly as an antiquarian bookseller I knew in Shimla exhibited an overpriced edition of the Illustrated London News, until in an awkward but necessary conversation, I reminded you that I was actually comfortably off only by Indian standards. We would take an Uber back, suddenly mute now in its darkness, as you checked your social media feeds, often the first reports of the events we had just attended the loud colors from your screen flowing across your face, 
whose eager intent always made me a bit jealous. To emerge from the car in your street, the private gardens with high railings on one side and glowing French windows on another, to open the blue front door of your apartment and hear it shut behind us with the oil click of an expensive lock, to then find ourselves subtly lit in amber in the tall gilt-framed hall mirror and to hear the grandfather clock ticking vigilantly was to know security again. At a time when so many of my thoughts and memories were shaded by sorrow and guilt, your old apartment in Kensington, home to several generations of your family, and still suggesting in its renovated state all the great many things said and done inside it, became a kind of reassurance. The space and order of, and light of its vast high ceiling rooms suggesting a durable fastness against death and separation. During those long London twilights, the windows of even the homes of strangers showcased a reality that seemed to have stood firm and eternal for centuries. A woman lying in an armchair holding a glass of white wine, children reading or playing or drawing, a man taking off his tie, and a cat crawling out between rope back curtains to lounge fatly on a sill. Coming from a society rent by anarchic poverty and cruelty, where you could never feel history to be on your side, mm -hmm. or any institution of government and law working in your favor, coming from a society that had frightened and traumatized so many of us for life, I was learning how to appreciate, or at least not be afraid of, a rich and steadfast world. Then too, we avoided living in that part of London, the journeys through terraces of brick past boarded up shops, cardboard dwellers, and iPhone snatchers, hints to me of a larger dereliction up north, the deindustrialized country about which I knew nothing except that it had sprung Brexit upon unsuspecting Londoners. How much easier it was in that reassuringly expensive watering hole of Russian and Asian oligarchs, where the destitute, unlike India's, slumped in doorways, nearly always out of sight, to enjoy the city's array of parks, restaurants, and bookshops, to experience even things abandoned on the pavements as a kind of visual novelty. How lightly our legs skipped over the devout row of shoes on the pavement outside a mosque in South Hall, where we had ventured to get your fix of desi khana at a restaurant serving authentically Gujarati food, and how great was the security of the rich tourists that I felt in the Mithai shop with the garlanded portrait of Modi we repaired to afterwards, the security that those raving about kebab drives and Sufi shrines in seedy old Delhi, my old workplace, always knew. I think I'm going to stop there. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I will try and be do this in about half an hour, sure. and then open it up for the last half an hour. Right. So thank you. So um, I read this novel in one sitting, and uh, partly because it was gripping, because it gave words to my life in terms of you know this is uh, you and I are both of the same generation. Uh, we grew up in an India which not just witnessed this kind of turn from late post-coloniality to heady globalization, but also, um, this is a personal note, uh, neither you nor I grew up in Delhi, India's political capital, always the destination for literary and political stardom, nor did we grow up in the crumbling colonial cities of Chennai, Madras, uh, Calcutta, preeminently, uh, or even Bombay, the forever city. So it spoke a lot to me. I could somehow recognize some of the characters to our piano. Uh, I shouldn't, shouldn't say anything about the, 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 just the sherry drinkers. But, um, but actually, it's really, uh, the book is an intimate portrayal of, as it were, the psychic life. You know, you, uh, Chris, kindly outed my psychoanalyst moment here. And what the, the kind of psychic, not just cost, uh, but consequence of this life has wrought on all sorts of Indians. Uh, to their intimate lives, their sort of you described more of the outward side in your readings here, but that would not be a complete portrayal of the book because the book is quite a rich canvas of sentiments, human sentiments. So the book is very much of India, but it's also in that sense incredibly human. 
and pessimistic, if I may say so, uh, on, on, on what human possibility might be uh, at the very moment of sort of height of globalization. I won't want to give the plot away, uh, but it has a very contemporary ring for people here too, because it's shot through with questions of masculinity. There's a Me Too episode, uh, financial living with high finance, and of course, um, a theme that interests me as well, the fate of literary and intellectual stardom in our age, image-obsessed age. Um, so, but also, uh, this is a book about love for me, but not merely romantic love. So you mentioned the, the you know, Alia and, and the main character, but I thought uh, not just platonic friendships, some toxic friendships, uh, certainly between some of the main protagonists, uh, but uh, poignantly, the love of parents and from parents, uh, which is a big theme. Certainly, um, I'm not sort of trying to typify this as an Indian uh, love, but it was good to see a contemporary rendition of the parent-child relationship in the Indian context. Uh, and I think um, the, the relationship of peers, which is very rarely addressed in contemporary Indian novels, uh, which are much more between genders, uh, and sexuality, uh, I found quite refreshing. But there's a quiet theme, and I will end with drawing you on, out on that, with, as it were, arguably the love of or the rejection of God in your book, uh, or a higher you know, story here. Uh, because, of course, um, I also share your obsession with the Indian Himalayas and the solace uh, that they uniquely provide uh, to many Indians, but also other seekers of uh, solace. So it's really, for me, the first major and real novel on India's globalization. So I'll start with drawing you out on that. And uh, the first question is, why did you return to the novel form, the genre of the novel, to explore this? Because, of course, uh, a lot of us are familiar with your uh, political commentary, your even historical work. And what is it that the novel could do which you had already so assiduously dissected and analyzed for us? I think, I mean, uh, the novel, all the things you mentioned, the psychic lives, um, the inner transformations uh, amongst people who are making this incredible transition um, from a very rural existence to metropolitan life, breaking free of everything that had dis defined them in the past, family, community, particular tradition, sometimes religious commitments mm -hmm. of, of various sorts. Um, and I think, I mean, it's, uh, I think it's important to say how dramatic and large scale this transformation mm -hmm. in India is today because that transformation happened here a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, when people started to move away from rural areas, from the authority of the church or, or Christianity in general, and became secular, mm -hmm. uh, embraced secular profession. That transition is still ongoing mm -hmm. in India today, and it's the biggest transition that we will ever see anywhere in the world, I mean, mm -hmm. apart from China. Mm -hmm. And I think fiction has done a very poor job yeah. of describing that, that, that transformation. It's really kind of, I think it's really touched the surface of mm -hmm. what has been happening in India. And I felt increasingly, I mean, to give a short answer mm -hmm. to your question, that the, the nonfiction I was writing uh, was not able to touch that either. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, you know, obviously uh, dealing with established facts about, you know, uh, obviously the, 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 the material of nonfiction is fixed. Mm -hmm. There's not much you can do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't really deepen it beyond a point. Mm -hmm. Whereas imaginative fiction allows you to go into all kinds of places. It allows you to speculate about uh, people's motivation, their inner lives, and you know, also employs a certain experience that you can never employ in nonfiction, mm -hmm. which is of knowing people intimately, of knowing people over a long period, of seeing them transform. And there's absolutely no way you can write intimately about people in nonfiction without inviting uh, a, a lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. you know, yeah. you, with, with fiction gives you that liberty to, you know, talk about things that have happened to you, that have happened to other people, yeah. transform them in, in fiction, you know. Um, and then as you go on, again, this is wonderful thing about fiction, the thrilling thing about fiction, you don't know really where you're going and mm -hmm. that's, that's exhilarating at, at one level mm -hmm. because you're led yeah. on by a few things you've created on the page, a few images, few characters, and 
uh, it, the, you know, the, 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 you, you're going on and on, and it's the, 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 what you're writing is, 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 is going very deep inside your memories, your experiences. And the way those memories are being transformed, you have no idea really how it's all being done. Whereas in, in, in nonfiction, it's a far more self-conscious process. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that comes out very clearly in the book that there is a desire or a demand to leave the past. And, and yet you're never able to, I mean, that's one of the problems of these characters is to not be able to exit out of the past. Uh, and that brings me very directly to actually our own time framing within the history of India. So both you and I uh, grew up with, we're not the generation, we're not Midnight's children. So we are not people who could have really embraced the optimism of uh, you know, decolonization, freedom. In fact, quite the opposite. We grew up with a pessimism around India, a kind of um, criticism of Nehru, uh, both from the left uh, and the right, and of course, your generation, our generation is also at the cusp of the liberalization. So our, our peers and our running institutions in India, all the all the beneficiaries, as it were, they were the first age beneficiaries of India's globalization. So I remember distinctly uh, the day I had Coca-Cola for the first time mm -hmm. when it came, uh, you know, uh, in, you know, in, in you know, and that because we lived in a protected economy. Uh, so. The, or the brands, you know, you mentioned a litany of Indian brands, which are household brands, and which evoke a kind of nostalgia. But, you know, my friends from Pakistan were surprised we had never heard of many of the standard global brands, you know, uh, toothpaste, for instance, That's right. you know. Yeah. And, you know, so we have a very different, obviously, so I share that with you. But uh, my, my question really was about really that, you know, how do you yourself sort of, situate that kind of full-on pessimism of Nehru's world that had that was our inheritance and uh, I would say the recoil you have in the book on the joys of globalization on the joys of you know you know leaving India behind in whatever way uh, the old India behind either mentally or physically like in the case of our own like in your own case or like in my case I think you know the 1980s, if you remember, was a was a pretty bleak decade. Mm -hmm. um, all the fault lines in India that are glaring at us today were visible back in the mm -hmm. back in the 1980s. Whether you know uh, the divide, the communal divide, the caste uh, mm -hmm. divide, the 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 kind of you know latent prejudice there, the political fragmentation. Um, all of that was there, and then suddenly the 1990s arrived, liberalization arrived in 1991. I mean, I think there's a rough parallel, as you were speaking, I was thinking there's a rough parallel to what happened here mm -hmm. after the bleak years of the, of the 1970s, mm -hmm. and suddenly first Thatcher and then Blair opened up this sort of you know, new possibility of a new, mm -hmm. the cool Britannia. Mm -hmm. And I think that there was a similar uh, mode of intoxication in India in the 90s, beginning in the 1990s, that globalization is arriving, this is going to create, as Asim says, a completely new landscape of liberation, mm -hmm. where we would have access to possibilities that our parents could not even dream of. Mm -hmm. um, and it's you know, quite right that they could not dream of it because they would be scandalized mm -hmm. by what was now on, on offer. Um, so I think we moved very quickly from you know a bleak decade of assassinations, pogroms, communal rioting, um, and, 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 and sort of really kind of crazy modes of politics to suddenly thinking India is going to be a superpower and we're all going to be you know, quite uh, well off mm -hmm. quite soon. Um, and there was obviously at that point, there was not much reckoning with you know, what, was, what is actually the basis of this optimism, this crazy optimism. Uh, what, what, what are the economic facts that warrant such, uh, such optimism? But nevertheless, there was a generation, I think that's the generation I describe in the book, mm -hmm. which was perfectly placed to benefit mm -hmm. from that moment of opening up. Mm -hmm. They'd just come out of college, uh, globalization, liberalization, everywhere in the world required people from the global south to come and work in the West to come and work in Europe. They were setting up, obviously, offices in India, mm -hmm. Indonesia, China, 
And suddenly there were all kinds of opportunities opening up that had not been there previously. So this generation was perfectly placed to avail of those opportunities to travel to the West, suddenly become very rich there. You know, people who'd come from, you know, essentially uh, near destitute sort of backgrounds were suddenly, within about 10 years or so, they were billionaires. Mm -hmm. Again, this kind of transformation uh, obviously has happened to individuals here and there, but this happened literally to thousands and thousands of people. No, no that's right. And that's why it is a real phenomenon. It is a real phenomenon. So one of the ways in which, since you mentioned China, people have always compared that, I haven't been to China, so you perhaps, and people have always said that you can physically see the change you know, in cities. Whereas something that is noticed about India is that it, the change is not physical, which is why your book is so needed. It's actually the change in lives of people. It's actually that the, there hasn't been that expl much explosion of, say, infrastructure. We're beginning to see that under Modi. Under Modi, you know, you are physically seeing the change of the Indian landscape. Uh, but you could notice people's lives the way you describe them, from not just destitution to uh, hypermobility, uh, but also in small ways of what they ate, drank, who they talk, talked with. But I want to stick for one more minute with Nehru, uh, because Nehru set up the Indian Institute of Technology. He also um, allowed for the setting up of the university I studied in. Like, you know, like, unlike, say, African post-colonial leaders, uh, for good or bad, Nehru invested in higher education, in producing a national, technical, bourgeoisie, elite, call it, call it what you will. And the IITs were at the front and center of it because he had been to Cambridge and, you know, Nat Natsuki was a nat natural science student and wanted science to, as it were, you know, leapfrog India into a kind of modernity that had been denied to it because of colonialism. Yeah. And then you have these characters, I mean, you know, the crammers, you know, I just read the other day, Joe Johnson wants to bring IITs to London and to, you know, so this is what they want to bring from India in globalization to, to the UK. Um, okay, so they're elite institutions uh, and they are paid, they're paid for by the Indian state. But the interesting story is that most of them land up in Silicon Valley. Yeah, this is the backbone of the Silicon Valley in India. So there is no payback to India directly, maybe in remittances and, and the like. They do not do the work that Nehru asked, perhaps imagined them to do. So I wanted to actually ask you about this relationship of to India. We, I don't know, I certainly, I don't know, maybe personally speaking, but looking at these IIT people, that it, it demands something of you, it gives you something, uh, but that there's always a gap in the relationship between give and take from the place. Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. It's both a very demanding place, yeah. uh, a very unforgiving place, yeah. uh, not a place you can make mistakes easily in, but also a place uh, that will not cost you too much if you leave it. Sure. So Absolutely. could you say something a yeah, little no, bit I mean, about I think it's a, it's a great IIT sort of world and, historical irony that yeah. an institution that was set up explicitly for the purpose of national modernization mm -hmm. ends up essentially uh, you know, being a, a pool of talent for the hedge funders of Wall Street yeah. and si Silicon uh, Valley uh, companies. I mean, you know, as you know, m most of the big Silicon Valley companies, big internet companies are today run by All IIT people. Indians with IIT, IIT backgrounds. Um, and so in a way, I mean, obviously Nehru did not know this, this was gonna, this was gonna happen. But I think what's also interesting, what you just said about Nehru is that um, there's the institution building at one level, but also I sometimes wonder in what way psychologically did the Nehruvian project of national wealth and power mm. also prepare us for the present? Or for these kinds of characters, That's right. you know, the the important continuities. You know, people say we've gone beyond Nehru and we've now, mm -hmm. you know, entered a new, uh, new realm, India. new India defined by a different kind of ambition. But in many ways, the post-colonial project of national expansion, of national modernization, of developing a scientific temper, and all of that. In many ways, these characters that I describe in the book, they have completely embraced that. Mm -hmm. They are embodiments mm -hmm. of that. Uh, in many ways, except that. By the time they come of age, the national ideology has shifted. Globalization has transformed you know, all kinds of social imaginaries. Uh, so now you want to be 
part of the flourishing globalized world where you become a billionaire in two years or three mm -hmm. years, uh, as long as, ta as it takes. Um, and you're not at all interested in any kind of collective project, let alone you know, progress of India. You might pay lip service to it by you know, giving the BJP a lot of money if you're, if you're living elsewhere, if you're living abroad. But in the end, you're not going to be investing huge amounts of money in India. Uh, it's part of your identity now. It's part of your being this you know, great superpower. That's also you know, the Naipaul connection mm -hmm. in, the, yeah. in the book. It's a kind of mascot of the new India, the man who comes out of nowhere, uh, becomes very successful globally, and then identifies with this sort of rising, rising India. But I think we have to be alert to the continuities there, mm -hmm. uh, rather than you know, the ruptures that we too easily yeah. posit. I mean, I uh, think there is no escape. And I think one of the things that uh, your book really brings out nicely, and I'm not going to talk about it, but it has the story of caste and caste violence written into this, you know, uh, friendships. The case caste is a social fact in India. Uh, it, you know, it is identifiable by name. Uh, and then, you know, in the IITs, these men are thrown into this proximity of humiliation and uh, relations of humiliation, but ultimately also of some friendship, which is a kind of brutal friendship, actually. Yeah. It's a very, it's a, and uh, I wouldn't, toxic, but inescapable f and central to the story of India. But I actually wanted to return to the psychic dimension in which, in a way, why I would say that there is a slight difference between the Nehruvian age and ours, is that you know, the national elite, whether the, you were Gandhian or whether you were Nehruvian, had spent a long period educating Indians, you know, noblesse oblige or whatever you want to call it, uh, that you know, they had a purpose for national independence. And that there was going to be, you know, so for instance, my parents could happily uproot themselves from wherever they were Absolutely. and move to Chandigarh. This was the great post-colonial city of hope for Nehru, made by Le Corbusier. And they were not alone. Many people did that. Uh, and so for instance, they rejected London, you know. So it was that kind of, um, but there was a, the, the, but the difference now is a kind of psychic deficit, if I might, might say so, and that really, comes through in, in, the, in, in, in your story with all the characters. And that's a kind of, if I'm allowed a Freudian moment, you know, it's a kind of classic symptom in the sense that, you know, that which is going to enhance us is also going to destroy us. And the individual, however, is most attached to, to that symptom, Absolutely. you know, yeah. that kind of addictive symptom that, you know, you know something is, you, it's a kind of compelling order. After all, all these characters, they're not self-made. I mean, your book is very clear that these are not self-cleared. What, and they're not self-made. They, what they've done is, they've literally done what is expected of them, mm -hmm. right? And different, uh, they're very obedient in some ways. And uh, yet, they are destroyed characters and unable to actually find a way out of this, but also in love with who they are. This, these yeah. are all men, particularly, uh, who don't seem to be especially worried about, ultimately, you know. Uh, I mean, they're angst-ridden, but th they are sort of caught up in this bind with their own symptom, if I might say. Sure. And so this is a kind of neurosis of, if I may say, of globalization in India, which we see all over, and it's kind of very nice to see it in your characters. So would you want to say anything? Because I want to come to one exit path you offer towards the end of the conversation. Yeah, I think um, the whole project of self-expansion, self self-aggrandizement mm. that um, has become you know, mainstream in India, and that's also a very dramatic fact. Uh, because you know, I mean, large parts of India, a, a, a large number of Indians, at least when I was growing up, still inhabited a kind of pre-modern world. Uh, what do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. um, why, what I mean by that is their world, their aspirations, their desires were still circumscribed by certain traditional boundaries, religion, spirituality. There were certain commitments they had made, uh, either of a religious spiritual nature or to the family or community, which imposed natural limits on what they could want yeah. from life. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has those limits for many, many people, certainly in the case of these characters, have broken down. Uh, so it's living life without any kind of instruction manual whatsoever. 
Uh, it's basically pursuing your desires, pursuing whatever fantasy that you can develop. And the fantasies now come from all different sources. They mm -hmm. come from the media, they come from social media, legacy media. So it's, it's, um, it's a new idea of the self, mm -hmm. uh, a self that can only really exist um, while it's expanding. Otherwise, it has no meaning. Otherwise, it, is, it doesn't really exist. So only desire, continuous desire, continuous fulfillment of multiple desires define that, that particular self. At the same time, you're being undermined because the whole process of you know, desiring, and I mean, I take a more kind of yeah. Buddhistic line yes. in this, um, is, is leading you to more and more dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. And that is the nature of, 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 of desire in general. But I think going back to your Nehru uh, point about Nehru and Gandhi, it's interesting that even though, I mean, obviously the Nehruvian project is very different from the Gandhian mm -hmm. project, but what the Nehruvian project still has is a sense of limitation. I think there's a kind of mm -hmm. built-in austerity to that project. Mm -hmm. And Nehru himself personally embodied that. Yeah. Um, whereas there is no such austerity in this new version of modernity that arrived in, in India from the 90s. In fact, Austerity was seen as something um, quite comic. In fact, I, I remember in the 1990s, mm -hmm. it became almost a kind of, it became uh, obligatory for many columnists or writers to mock yes. the way they had been brought up yes. in this kind of austere yes. universe and to say, you know, what is this? Now, today we all recognize the virtue, the value of austerity faced with an environmental <laughs> crisis, of course. But, but, you know, India actually in many ways started out with that, those mm -hmm. values, yeah. uh, that, that austerity is important. Uh, so much of Gandhianism is built around that mm -hmm. idea. And that survived. I think Nehru, there was aspects of Nehru. Completely uh, austere. Uh, very, very austere. <laughs> and that has disappeared. So you're really looking at an incredibly driven and incredibly lost several generations now. Uh, and, and this is what makes me downbeat, generally downbeat, about India today, is that we've lost touch with this very long past. Uh, we've come very far away from that. We've yet to measure the psychic costs mm -hmm. of that rupture, of that immense journey we've made. Mm -hmm. And you know, we are confused as husbands, wives, mm -hmm. sons, uh, mm -hmm. uh, siblings. Mm -hmm. We all have very complicated relationships mm -hmm. uh, in our families. Mm -hmm. And it is because we are in a completely uncharted territory. Uh, yeah, but also in a very demanding world. In a very, So very it could demanding. be uncertain, uncharted, but it's also a demanding world. So I actually uh, wanted to ask two, just two questions left. I'll come to the question of Buddhism and uh, and austerity, I just want to say on austerity, uh, it, I would be remiss to not mention that Prime Minister Modi has channeled it for himself as a kind of uh, you know, self-abnegating non-family man. So I think austerity is very much a, a, a theme in Indian life, but has gotten re redistributed in quite unrecognizable fashion. Uh, in, and of course, Gandhi's project was exactly that, that Modernity is a set of appetites that cannot be fulfilled. And so how do you produce? And that's why Nehru and the like. So I take all that really well. My question was to return to the West and to talk about the kind of failure, this kind of very optimistic, I'm not giving it away really, uh, the failure of love in this book, which works at two levels, both at the level of the romantic relationship, but also of this kind of embracing journey of this very self-fashioned character, narrator, you know, very deliberate, uh, make self-made, intellectually self-made figure. Um, and the kind of, you know, I wouldn't say disenchantment of love from London, uh, but yes, I mean, disappointment, uh, disappointment with the West, disappointment with London, a disappointment with why did I read all this stuff and what if, you know, it, it doesn't save him, let alone give him clues uh, of his own life. And it kind of chimes with our personal moment, very current moment of deglobalization, you know, so that we're all kind of deglobal. So, and in the age of anger, you have written all about it in a kind of much more nonfiction way. You've analyzed that story. So really, where do we go for forms of enchantment? You know, if the West is, you know, disenchanted, um, deglobalization is everywhere. Neo-nationalism is the story. In fact, people in India are arguing that it's pre-modern 
sources might be the way forward. Uh, take, make what you will of it. Um, so where do you see the kind of deglobalization moment, especially for these kind of characters uh, yeah, who have, it, a, have seen it's both a tremendous, sides? It's a tremendous loss because what sustained um, many of the characters in this book and indeed what has sustained many people in India with the loss of uh, with the destruction of the old post-colonial ideologies of mm -hmm. development, modernization, autonomy, non-alignment, any number of projects that really uh, gave meaning to people's lives. You know, mm -hmm. the, the fact that your parents would not move to London, they would prefer to stay back in Chandigarh, and that there was something pressing on upon their, mm -hmm. you know, these, these particular decisions. And what replaced it in the starting the 90s was this project of, well, we call it globalization, but it was actually westernization. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to be more specific, Americanization. Mm -hmm. uh, globalization or Americanization was the only game in town. Uh, you know, people explicitly said that. Thomas Friedman said, I want everyone in the world to be an American. That was a serious project. That was a serious project pursued uh, by politicians, businessmen, Financial Times, economists. You go back and read. This was the ideology they retail, and a lot of people believed it. We're talking about hundreds of millions of people who actually believed this was going to be possible. And you know, that many billions of people in India and China were one day going to be enjoying the lifestyles uh, enjoyed by a tiny minority of Europeans and Americans. Now, those dreams have been shattered. Mm -hmm. um, environmental crises, political crises, every, you know, you name it, every, every kind of crisis that has erupted in the last 15 uh, years or so has made it clear that that's not going to happen, uh, that we have kind of moved into another phase altogether, which is deglobalization. Mm -hmm. And I think deglobalization is not really just you know, the weakening of trade links or the facts that, you know, ships cannot enter Shanghai right now <laughs> because of the lockdown. Yes. It's, I think a big shift has happened mentally and psychologically, yeah, is agree. that the West is no longer a source of redemption. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is creating a big crisis everywhere. I mean, I think uh, in many ways, people like Modi or other autocrats, even Putin, mm -hmm. I think is a symptom of that loss of faith in the project of westernization. Let's not forget, Russia was at the forefront of that project yes. in the 1990s. Yes, and we grew up with Russian literature. We, we uh, yeah, grew up uh, with that, you know, and then you know, Russia yeah. was going to be Americanized yeah. very explicitly and, and openly by Americans themselves. Mm -hmm. They were there, you know, tutoring the, the, the Russians and how to become uh, more like Americans. So that, those projects have really failed, and I think you know, this is what we are, we are left with today. Politically, uh, you know, we are left with these sort of you know, various uh, uh, figures trying to resurrect some kind of an imperialist past for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, Putin, of course, Modi too in a different, mm -hmm. different way, some kind of fantasy of a past. And I think most importantly for the purpose of a novelist, I think uh, you know, personally we all find ourselves at a kind of impasse mm -hmm. where, you know, again, uh, like where do you go? Well, you realize you've been on a massive adventure here, That's you know, true. that breaking free of uh, everything that defined uh, hu human lives for such a long time, was that such a wise thing to do, to breaking free of uh, principles and values that emphasize austerity? Was that such a wise thing to do, to embrace a culture of endless consumption? Uh, so I think, you know, there's a lot of, I, I, I would imagine there's a lot of rethinking going on, um, you know, which would manifest itself in all kinds of ways. But I think that definitely, that big project that replaced mm -hmm. the big uh, post-colonial projects has also not failed, and that is the moment and, we are. And in. have and taken a very short while to come undone. Absolutely. Unlike the post-colonial project. So my final question is actually about exit paths and perhaps even God here. I don't know, but there's a kind of repose in the book, which I really, for me, that was a very strong takeaway of the book, and uh, and it's not only because I love the Himalayas as you do. But there's a kind of haunting call of renunciation. You've talked much more about uh, austerity, which surprised me today. But there's a kind of renunciatory element in, in the book. And uh, so because there's a kind of failure of all unions in, in, the, in the book, I mean, this is not to give away the plot, but really the kind of impasse that you mentioned of love, of finding meaning in work, or even political life, you know. So I was you know, reminded of your ex excellent work on Buddhism when I was reading it. You don't really reference it overtly. Your earlier work on 
walking in the Buddhist trail. And um, so could, could I draw you out as the future Buddhist? And if that is the case, if there are, you know, then um, I just want to put a kind of slightly controversial or semi not, would be known to you that argument by Zizek, Savoy Zizek, who argues that actually uh, Buddhism is the perfect accompaniment for neoliberalism because it now again turns everything onto the self uh, and asks you not to demand anything of the world uh, and just make peace with it and exploit yourself at, at best as you can. Uh, I, I'm not going to say what I think of that, but it is a criticism of you know, neo-Buddhism uh, that he has made. So could you sort of say something on, on as it were, the repose, the renunciatory element yeah. and Buddhism? Yeah, I suppose the Buddhism he has in mind is in, you know, the, the easily mocked and parodied Buddhism that you mm -hmm. find, uh, let's say, in, in, in Madonna, mm -hmm. uh, or any number of you know, celebrities you can think of, or you know, various corporate outfits running mindfulness mm -hmm. lessons mm -hmm. and so on. We're not really concerned with that oh, well. aspect of, of Buddhism. But I think you know, it, it plays uh, an important role in almost everything I write, uh, mm -hmm. I, although you know, I speak as a failed Buddhist. But Buddhist um, epistemology, mm -hmm. um, I feel like it's, it's, it's something um, that really opens up doors all the time in, in various situations, can help explain so many different things. But more important than that is this idea of, um, again, you know, I, I think you put it really well, which is sort of what is this bundle of appetites here for? Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Where do these appetites lead us? Mm -hmm. Isn't this, and I'm you know, breaking down into something very simple, isn't it wise, you know, not just for our karma, of the karma mm -hmm. of the people around us, but for you know, the continuance of human life on this earth, for animal life on this earth, for us to limit our desires, for, for us to limit our appetites. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the extreme version of that choice is renunciation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know it's hard not to be obsessed with it if you live in as I have in in a, in a part of India, which is surrounded by people yes. who've done who've done that. Mm -hmm. And I suppose you know it feels very odd talking about it here yeah. because you likewise hardly, I mean yeah it's how you hardly ever find people who've done that who've kind of given up the world. But you only have to go ten miles in the interior from where my Indian home is to find people who've done that who've been living that kind of life. Uh, for, for several years, if not decades now. And they've found you know, a new basis for mm -hmm. contentment mm -hmm. uh, in this very small scale, small scale life. This is not a lesson, this is not an example that can be generalized or turned into a kind of exhortation you know, that other people should also be following in that path. But it's, I think that, that person, the renunciant or the renouncer, has always served that purpose in cultures uh, over, over, over the centuries uh, of defining, really defining the essential limits of desire mm -hmm. and the fundamental discontentment that lies at the basis of you know, pursuits of desires. Um, and I feel like losing that important spiritual resource, or I think philosophical resource, has been a great tragedy. Yeah. Uh, for, for many of us who are now living in a very secular, secular world. So, you know, bringing that theme into the novel was a way of gesturing at mm -hmm. that. You know, I feel like, again, uh, this is going into another territory altogether. I feel like monks, uh, renunciants, used to have a big presence in 19th century literature. They had a big presence Cambridge. in Tolstoy. Yeah. Cambridge is a Absolutely. monkish place. And like, how had they disappeared mm -hmm. from contemporary mm -hmm. fiction? So my way of, like, let's, let's bring this figure back. Uh, let's put him in a contemporary novel. Um, and, you know, it's not false to my experience at all. In the contrary, no, no. I actually, I could have done more with it. That's and, right. Uh, I mean, I, I wanted more, actually. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, Pankaj. I'm going to open it uh, to the floor now. Any questions? Any thoughts? Something, please. Yes, Martin. Joyce says somewhere how deeply and vividly feels about having to express himself in the language I wonder if this is something that you experienced um, while writing this novel. I wonder more generally what it means to you to write in English with even a choice. And finally, I wonder if there's something about the English language and about English literature that perhaps 
enabled you to, to imagine and also to capture the modernity that was actually denied to India, should be said, by the British colonizers. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, English is, is my second language. It remains at many different levels an alien language. Uh, it's not the language in which I feel my emotions. And for that reason, whatever books I've written, and including this one, um, there's always a very strong current of the vernacular running through it. So there are actually you know, pieces of dialogue which I've not bothered to uh, translate or I, I'm not, I've just put them in Hindi there. Mm -hmm. So anyone who reads in Hindi will be able to read those bits and thereby have immediate access to that particular cultural world that the vernacular always creates. And that can never really be truly rendered into, into English. So, you know, these are the little compromises, these are the little ways in which you seek to uh, render a world in English that, you know, is not really renderable. Um, but I think, obviously, English, you know, creates a different kind of access. Um, we just mentioned that yourself. But I'm beginning to learn, I'm learning Spanish now, I'm beginning to read in it a little bit more. And I'm realizing that actually, maybe English has prevented me from a whole range of emotional experiences or national experiences that are now accessed through reading a writer in Peru, for instance, again, the, or, 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 or Mexico, uh, again, the experience of underdevelopment, the, the, the kind of paradoxical or abortive experience of modernity. These are things that bring a, a, a writer or a person in Mexico much closer to me, a, a, a writer from India, than say so much of what is written in English or has been written in English. So English facilitates exposure to you know, uh, different kinds of experiences that allow me to write in this way but it also limits at the same time mm -hmm. by being such an imperialistic language, uh, by, you know, essentially, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really uh, have thought of learning Spanish until, you know, this late in my life uh, if I hadn't, you know, suddenly made that decision. There was nothing really, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, kind of pushing me in that direction. But now I do, I suddenly realize there's the whole universe that is simply unknown to me mm -hmm. and should not have been unknown to me, that this speaks to me much more directly um, a writer I mean, from can I just say that on this, that I actually, this is where we sort of depart a little bit because I do not consider English my second language. It's part of my, one of three first languages. So uh, I'm, you know, conversant and, and able, so I would not be able to, but I was interested in this move also because another, not the same trajectory, but diasporic writer, Jhumpa Lahiri, I just recently read her book, The Italian, she's learned Italian, then written in Italian, and then got it translated in English. I mean, Martin's question is more, I think, also about not just empire, but you seem to want empathy in Spanish. Mm -hmm. But with Jhumpa Lahiri, it seems like the other theme, the exit out of India, That's right, to yeah. be able yeah. to experience something which is not so Indian. Um, so what, where does the Spanish thing? Yeah, no, the I Spanish, mean, uh, Spanish thing is for me a way of connecting with experiences of individuals and societies that English has barred me from. Mm -hmm. um, and that only through learning Spanish and through reading in Spanish, a lot of literature that is only available in Spanish, will I be able to access those experiences? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, I'm not seeking an exit or an escape from the world of English or mm -hmm. Anglophone literature in general. That is hugely important. And at some stage I've become capable enough, I would probably start translating from Spanish into English. So I think it's, you know, it remains a very important language for me. Jumpalari's uh, intention, I think it is quite different. Exa it's exactly I'm how you sure. described I mean, it. I'm just no, I think it's exactly how you described yeah. it. That, she thinks that, it, that her, her language was really in one, many, many ways imposed on her, the English language. Yeah, that's the question. And that she mm -hmm. wants to uh, find a language where she thinks she's the agent. Mm -hmm. You know, she's the one initiating the whole process of learning a language, entering its inner life. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, very helpful. Yes, there's a question at the back. You're clearly a, an expert tributor between um, social criticism 
and, um, and, and the imaginative world uh, for which uh, readers like me are, are extremely grateful. Um, and I would venture to say that um, in both facets of your work, you're addressing uh, a kind of poverty, either poverty of the imagination or an impoverishment of political explanation. Uh, once upon a time, I would have said that the explanation, not of you, but generally, the explanation has to have logical priority. Otherwise, we can't generate an imagination. Um, but I think I'm, I've come uh, around to putting it the other, the other way uh, recently, that I'm thinking that we can't generate, without first attempting to uh, uh, re address the imaginative problem, uh, explanation can only be just a form of calculation that, that fits the people who calculate that way. Um, and I wonder whether um, you've shifted your priorities uh, during the course of your career to the imaginative or the explanatory, or is it really just a matter of what you happen to be working on at the time? Um, I think I probably have shifted, or at least in the process of shifting. Um, which makes me look very shifty. <laughs> but I think um, one of the reasons, I mean, one of the many reasons why I chose to go back to fiction and probably will stay in that realm for a while was my uh, increasing disillusionment with what I was writing, um, uh, the essays, the work that I was doing, where, again, I felt I was failing to convey the true complexity of many of the situations I was, I was writing about. And there was that. That was my personal failure. And then I think there was a feeling that the intellectual life that I've chosen, the life of publication in the magazines or periodicals I write for, that life has become corrupted. That has very little to do with me. Um, but you know, that is how it, what, that's what has happened in those places where I write for, whether it's the New York Times or the Guardian, where a certain kind of explanation is privileged over all others, yeah. uh, where a certain way of thinking is privileged over all others. And there are cruder versions of that. If you have more Instagram followers or Twitter followers, <laughs> your argument will be heard. But even when Twitter did not exist, that degeneration had already started to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like, OK, you know, um, if this is how it works, then maybe I don't want so much a part of this. I will continue to write uh, against these constraints, um, push against them as much as possible. But I will also go back to you know, what I used to do uh, in the past, which is go back to imaginative writing mm -hmm. uh, and move away from increasingly an instrumental, highly professionalized intellectual life to an imaginative life which probably is completely useless. You know? uh, maybe that's a big divide between the two, is that the imaginative life or the life of the imagination cannot really be truly be in instrumentalized yeah. in the same way that the life of uh, explanation-driven narratives is constantly. And that I also find a great relief mm, to stay away from uh, debates of various sorts where the positions you hold are immediately you know, recognizable or not, or, or your shoe. Yeah. Yeah. They have to be either recognizable or your shoe. Absolutely, out. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, so many of the things I write about in, in this book, if it was possible to turn them into sound bites or even an essay, um, they would Im immediately become weapons in some kind of a culture war. Uh, so, I can only really write about them in this way, in this form. Oh, that's very instructive. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Any, uh, yes? by your reference to learning Spanish, um, which is itself, of course, a colonial language. It's the lengua de los conquistadores. Do you find it more colonial or less colonial than English? Um, you know, I've not reached that stage yet where I can make, start to make those kinds of distinctions, um, very honestly. But I feel that with all the long centuries that Spanish has had in in, in, in Latin America, for instance, um, that enough has been done to the language, that enough um, input has come in from these other uh, linguistic traditions, these other cultural traditions, for it to cease being uh, uh, you know, colonial language in the way English 
you know, remains a kind of imperialistic language because it drives out so many other languages out of circulation. Um, whereas Spanish, you know, it's interesting how it, there are so many indigenous languages still alive in, 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 in Latin America. In places like Bolivia, there are so many of those. Um, and the literature there is still being informed by those traditions. Uh, so it's in that sense, it's very different from Spanish, Spanish uh, 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 literature uh, that you know, someone like Neruda could write about Machu Picchu and what it meant to that, um, to that particular culture and to that particular society. And then it was taken up. It was a kind of revelation for so many people to discover those traditions or Octavio Paz mm. writing about uh, the, the indigenous traditions of, of Mexico. I just don't think there's been that kind of um, you know, rediscovery or mm -hmm. uh, re-examination enabled by English in all the countries where it has been so dominant. Um, yeah, great. Yes, Thomas. Um, in terms of your discussion of Buddhism and how that might have some kind of path towards re-enchanting the ne neoliberal life and times, that seemed to me really overlap with I don't know if Gandhi has some kind of secular version or approach to a similar kind of Buddhist mission, and how much does that have a role in, in modern India nowadays? How much does that have sway? How much could it as well with, in your opinion, I guess? You mean the... Like the Gandhian approach as a kind of secular version of Buddhism, but that's probably a very bad way of putting it. I've not read yeah. into it. I think, you know, what Shruti said earlier is really important about, you know, how that tradition has been... Uh, because obviously still carries a great deal of potency and has a great deal of appeal to many, many, many Indians, um, both young and old. Um, it can be put to very, very uh, insidious political uses. And I think you, you can see that with someone like Modi when he goes off uh, with you know, hundreds of cameras, crews to a cave to meditate and sits there with the cameras focused on him for a little while, um, while it's being live streamed mm -hmm. or something, you know, like that. Um, so he's, he's very, he's, he's, a, he's a great communicator. He's a genius of the heart. He just knows uh, what many Indians want, what they feel, and he's able to speak to them very clearly. Um, so he's, he's invoking those particular traditions. But I think we should probably not be so dismissive of that, because I think what it does point to is the presence of these alternative traditions that have been lost to sight in different parts of the world, uh, that these things still exist, that these things still have value, uh, that they've not been completely overwhelmed by the trends of secularization, um, and that there is still something still pushing back mm -hmm. against that, that sort of idea of the world essentially as something to be endlessly consumed. Yeah, any final? Questions to take? Oh, yeah, there's a question there, yes. Thank you very much. So, I would like to return to the uh, novel itself. And so, it seems like novel gives you a chance, to, gives you a way to portray the psychic experience of a individual, but at, at the same time, we heard a lot of generations and Indian globalization. Where do you pinpoint? And like novel is stronger, or especially your novel, is it like more tend to um, represent an individual experience or a more communal experience? This this question is important for me because, for example, in Japan, some writers nowadays are claiming a return to modern, a return to novel as national literature, so that as a way to kind of fight against globalization, which I think is very symptomatic, just as you identified that this is like a fantasy of the past and also a loss of, uh, the sense of loss in moment of deglobalization. So what do you think about like, I mean, you know? You know my feeling is that, uh, that some of these questions are raised because we are too beholden to a certain very American idea of literature which is where literature is about private experience. But if you read you know, the great writers who define modern literature from the 19th century onwards, they're very deeply concerned with the fate of their societies. Uh, they're very directly concerned with it. They're not just talking about you know, some uh, adulterer in, in suburban Massachusetts. 
with no connection to anything that is happening in America at that particular moment. Um, they are very concerned with you know how that how that relates to what is happening in their society at large. Whether you know even someone like Flaubert, uh, sentimental education, mm. he's concerned with the fate of a generation. Mm. Uh, and those are the, that, that is the particular generation, the characters he chooses. He's obviously concerned with the private life. That is the novel's primary concern. But he's also, he also has a broader view of you know, what happened in 1848 and that massive historical event around which he organizes his novel. And the same with Tolstoy. I mean, can, can one imagine uh, a, a Tolstoy without those kinds of social concerns or political concerns or the life of a society, Dostoevsky, they're all concerned with those kinds of subjects. I think it's only in the last two, three decades where globalization or Americanization has meant that people in so many societies, including Japan, I mean, I think Murakami is actually a very interesting instance of yeah. you know, breaking free from older traditions and writing novels that are weightless that lack political density or social density and are about individuals can be consumed in Argentina, they can be consumed in Indonesia without having to master any specific references whatsoever to Japanese society in the 1980s or, 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 or 1990s. Interesting. Um, I mean, I have to say, I should mention this because the big influence on this book uh, are actually Chinese artists mm. uh, from early 2000s when I started to travel in China, I came across a literature in a cinema that was very deeply concerned with what was happening in China post Mao, uh, post liberalization. And that seemed to me so intimate, their account of you know, what had happened, what was happening to young men and women, you know, filmmakers, writers, all really concerned with, we've come out of this culture of poverty and destitution, conformity, uh, severe discipline, and suddenly, you know, this this sort of cornucopia of, of of capitalism is available to us, and people are going completely mad. Um, and again, their personal relations being transformed. So that was really, in in many ways, a kind of primary inspiration for this book. You know, people again concerned with larger questions, not just you know, uh, I'm going to describe this particular experience in a particular place, and I don't need any social reference or any kind of contemporary reference whatsoever. So there was a kind of, people have written books about it now, there was a kind of global novel that came into existence uh, alongside you know, various other processes of, of, of globalization. Amar? A question for you about the novel as a kind of esoteric form. You've kind of uh, talked a little bit about this. And um, I was wondering whether contemporary India and the rise of Modi um, played a role in that, and whether it, that informed some of the arguments that you're making in the book, it, uh, you know, in an esoter esoteric way. Is there something that you can say here about India which you can't otherwise? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely the. Psychic distortions, um, I think that I suppose the last five, six years, we've seen writ large in the politics of India, um, in the kind of hatred and loathing that is openly expressed there. Um, I felt like uh, people have written about it as though this has just erupted uh, and this is Modi's fault. The fact that this spiritual climate has been in preparation for a while uh, that these fantasies of wealth and power and sex and fame um, have been simmering for a long time. And they have taken this particular form now because they're increasingly frustrated. And we're simply not in the same phase of globalization anymore. In fact, we're going in the reverse, and that's why these energies have become toxic. Um, but I think, you know, I mean, I, th I, I certainly think I would not have written this book had not... Uh, had Modi not won the election in 2014, because obviously he f he's forced us all to reckon with these realities. He's brought them into the open. I think we have to give him credit for that, uh, because for a long time they were concealed, they were hidden. Mm -hmm. And that made it really difficult to write about India. And you, write a, you wrote about it pointing to you know, various 
political indicators or economic indicators or you know you would say I would you would make the argument I did numerous times that the story about rising India is you know it's it's fake it has no basis in reality these are the statistics how many times can you say that same thing over and over again what are the deeper things that are happening in India at the same time um, and you know Modi really in a way forced the kind of reckoning with those okay a final question Charlie so why not humanity students? As in, you know, uh, because it just takes me back to V. S. Naipaul's um, literary education, where he's initially really struggling with the question of self, and he thinks that he has no subject to write about, and then finally he go ba goes back to Trinidad and that small lane that he starts off with. So do you think that you know maybe had it been humanity students, they would have been perhaps a bit more conscious about the question of self or they would have been more questioning or, you know, why, other than Nehru and all of that, why IIT? Yeah. Well, I, I can answer that with an anecdote. You know, I used to, uh, I, I, I went to JNU, uh, which in those days um, shared a campus. Well, sort of. I mean, it was roughly neighbors to the IIT campus. So we'd go to IIT a lot. And I knew many people there. And I knew a professor, a, a very uh, good friend of mine, and he once told me, you know, he was a humanities professor, the most despised person on the campus, <laughs> because he was asking people to read this difficult literature. Um, and this was really quite a challenge for them. And he used to say, and I remember this, he says, my job is to teach you techies the role of ambiguity <laughs> in human affairs. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think at that point, you know, most people who are kind of waiting for a uh, 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 interview at Goldman Sachs or whoever uh, were not really interested in ambiguity <laughs> <laughs> so much, un un unless they could find a way of monetizing it. <laughs> um, so you know, his plea fell on deaf ears. But I think that was his that was his role. Um, and I feel you know, I think it is really interesting. Um, I would love to read a whole book about this. Like, why are so many techies supporters of various movements of ethnic racial shamanism? I mean, Elon Musk has again focused our brains mm -hmm. on this, but we saw this in India a long time ago. I mean, some of the earliest supporters of the BJP, before the BJP, before Modi was even around, were the techies uh, from many of these institutions. And I do think there was something missing there, which was that thing that the humanities education would have uh, taught them. Oh, that's a very positive, optimistic note to leave our humanities initiative on. So thank you so much, Pankaj. A total joy.